Ey olan tüm halkların hakları gibi haklar. Ne aşağı ne yukarı, ne fazla ne az. Can I feel that that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime? A lot of killers, a lot of killers. Why you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello, welcome to our blog. And today we are back with R.C. Charlie Robert. And we are talking about the legacy of the English psychoanalyst Wilfred Rupert Bion. Um, one of the more important psychoanalytic thinkers that is not popular in political circles, which I have often found interesting because he is queer, uh, clear, not queer, but, uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 um, and he is also, um, his, int- his primary levels of interest are, are in things like socioanalysis and uh, projective identification, which you would think anyone studying politics would be very interested in. So, so, so we started talking about good old Bayan in our last conversation that you were on here a few months ago, but uh, we didn't really get that much into it. And today we're devoting an entire episode to it. But I also like to give people warning: I am a little under the weather today. I'm recovering from a mild case of the Rona. So uh, I may not talk as much. And if I do rant, I may lose my voice. So heads up. Um, and with that, why is Bayan so important to your thinking, Charlie? <clears throat> well, um, let's see. First off, um, I think he is, at least to me, one of the better psychoanalysts on understanding the individual not only on their own but within groups you know within sort of a group dynamics um and i find i i'll put it this way i i tend to look into thinkers based off of how interesting they are um before i really get into the meat of it and whether how truthful it is or relevant it is to uh reality itself and so bion was kind of interesting because um there's there's three parts in my opinion to bion there's his theories on thinking and thought and how that develops uh in the individual there's his theories on group dynamics which um i i find to be pretty interesting and then there's kind of his view on how the analyst is supposed to relate to the, uh, to the, uh, analyzed. Um, for example, um, so in one of the, uh, many texts I've read about Bion, there's a story. I don't know if it was used by a Bion, but it's an interesting one. It's a kind of a parable. But there's a Catholic priest, and he's brought in to talk to some children about what baptism is. And he starts it off, and he asks them what they think it is. And they say it's a, you know, it's a, sacram- a sacrament used to wash off or wash away original sin. And the Catholic priest kind of uh, reproaches them for that, and he starts explaining in kind of an excited manner. That it's actually about having a new life and letting go of old ways. And, you know, he kind of gets into the meat of it, you know, gets overexcited, you know, kind of goes into the history of early Christianity. Anyway, after his whole lesson, um, he ends it and he asks them to repeat what the definition of bapt- uh, the baptism is. And they repeat the old definition. And so in Bion's thinking, 
um, he believes that oftentimes the problem with the relationship between an analyst and a subject or an, even an analyst and a topic is that they have, a, you know, theories that kind of get in the way of them actually being able to grasp a situation. So if you have a particular psychoanalytical take and you have a patient that comes in, the immediate thing you're going to do is instead of necessarily trying to understand the individual or what I would consider understanding the human condition, you start trying to categorize them into kind of the, the theoretical, um, let's say theoretical narrative that you have in uh, approaching people. So those are kind of the, the three things that I find are most important with uh, Wilfred Bion and why he factors into how I look at the world. Mm. So what do you think is, what do you think dr drives the fact that he has not been picked up so much? Uh, by left-wing political thinkers. I mean, he has been mentioned. He's mentioned in Endnotes. I forget which volume, one of the later ones. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Endnotes is a communization journal. Um, I, I have seen his work picked up by people like Daniel Tutt and other people who are interested in Lacanian psychoanalysis, but I have not seen him in general used the way you see Freud or Lacan or... I mean, sometimes I think part of it's just that the that American academia doesn't like picking up anyone British and admitting that they're doing it. But, um, and I mean, you know, more onto them. Yeah. I also think a, a, um, an instinctive distrust of the English is it's good for the soul. But uh, I think Bayon's, I mean, I, I find Bayon's uh, ideas of socioanalysis um, like to even overlap with, with things like uh, individual thinking and systems and and um, and um, behavioral economics and 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 the the refusal of typology is somewhat interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Well, as far as I can tell, and I'm going to have to generalize because I'm not entirely sure. But I would say that there's a there's a definite, very strong strain of American individualism, which I don't even consider as actually individualism. It's idealized. But, you know, there's a sense of individualism in, in American culture generally, which I think would clash and does clash with Bion's understanding of the individual where – he considers the individual immediately to be a group animal. Um, you know, he, he accepts, you know, something that a lot of people accept that humans are social animals, but he goes a step further and he says, for example, he rejects Nietzsche's idea of the herd uh, instinct and says, basically humans are group animals, whether we like it or not, we tend to fight it. We have a, a you know, we might, we might have problems with it, but we are ultimately um, group animals. And I, I just think that um, maybe the American, let's say American cultural take on things tends to kind of emphasize an individual, whether that's an individual within a system, an individual within a group, an individual within a community. There's kind of, a, 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 I'd say some kind of individualism that they like to be able to return to mm -hmm. um now i don't know anything about lacan or a lot of the other psychoanalysts so i'm just gonna be upfront about that so maybe i'm wrong <clears throat> since uh lacan has seemed to be picked up here recently um, i would say since since the 70s but yeah. yes <laughs> yeah right um and so you know maybe that's not it but that's that's kind of my my general uh feeling about that my general instinct is it's probably the groupishness that Bion insists on. So one thing I would actually find interesting here to, to talk about is the way groups interact with projective identification. And that's not a term coined by Bion, that's coined by Melanie Klein. And it it, it finds uh 
its initial instantiation in someone like Freud's whole idea of projective uh, uh, psychological projection. But what projective identification is so interesting is if you look at separately from this field of psychoanalysis, if you look at stuff like symbolic kinship research in anthropology or um, uh, uh, tribal identification and again in anthropology or in more or in moral psychology um, of the more you know neurological schools like people who like people who do like moral tribes frameworks and stuff um, that projective identification would overlap with that in a way that's copacetic with contemporary psychology in a way that a lot of psychoanalysts uh, psychoanalytic concepts aren't. Yes. Um, Bayan does a lot with it. I would argue Bayan seems to do more with it than even Melanie Klein does. So what do you think projective identification means in this context for like, you know, group analysis and socioanalysis? Well, um, I think, um, I think the best way to think about that is first, you know, just kind of start with some similarities with Bion and Klein, which is that being object relation theorists, that they believe that the creation of the individual, or in this case for Bion, the creation of individual thought and thinking apparatuses, starts with the relationship between the mother or caregiver and, and the child. And so Bion has a concept of the contained container. Uh, which is where he uses, at least to my understanding, uses projective identification. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, as like for groups or as you were mentioning for um, anthropology, um, the container contain idea sort of uh how do i put this i think it allows him to use projective identification in ways that even people like melody klein can't because um first um let's see i i'm deciding how far to go back here with buy on mm -hmm. um I'll put it this way, um, and we can return to this. So basically, when the, the relationship between the mother and the child develops an individual's thinking apparatus. Mm -hmm. And for, for Bion, Bion believed that thoughts preceded the ability to think, and that thinking um, preceded one's thinking apparatus. So when a child cries and people don't understand what's going on, it's mostly because the child is having sensory um, data that it can't understand. It doesn't know how to think. And so for Bion, on the basic level, thinking is kind of coping, if you will. And the way it learns to cope <clears throat> is through that projective identification with the mother. And it, as far as his work's concerned, caretaker, mother excuse me, where um, how the mother absorbs the negative emotions and projects positive emotions. Um, he argues that that ends up kind of defining the type of thinking apparatus that an individual has. Um, unlike Freud, it's not deterministic. It's not completely permanent. As far as he's concerned with, you know, therapy, obviously, if somebody were to have, let's say, a neglectful mother, where a certain thinking apparatus would create it to where a person can't cope with their thoughts quite as well. He thought that, you know, ther therapy later would be able to uh, fix that. But ultimately, um, what happens and the reason that this is important to groups is because once the child develops a thinking apparatus with their uh, mother or their caretaker. That is the kind of thinking apparatus and container-contained relationship that they carry out into other relationships. And so, for example, um, 
if you have a bad relationship with your mother, you tend to take that relationship and you project it onto the other people you meet. <clears throat> sorry, other people that you meet as you grow. And so this creates what he calls a valency type, which, you know, is um, the relationship to his concept and group dynamics of basic assumptions. Um, so a valency type more or less is one's tendency towards certain basic um, basic assumptions, um, what Melanie Klein would call uh, fantasies, where um, uh, hmm, sorry. Uh, lost my train of thought. I so on what Marilyn Klein would call fantasies. Okay. Um, so basically, um, the relate the, the contain container relationship that one develops with the mother gets projected onto under other individuals. And as your relationships go, you play both the part of the contained and the container as in, um, you know, Sometimes you're the person who's projecting and sometimes you're the person being projected on. And I'm, I'm sorry, this is a long way to get to it, what I'm trying to say. But um, to your point about groups, basically that underlying relationship and that style of container contained eventually develops into how you relate to a group, um, which for Bion... Um, as we establish, you're instinctually a part of, you're instinctually a, a groupish animal. And you, you kind of pick based off your <clears throat> valency type. Um, and so what this does is um, sorry. Mm -hmm. Lost it again. I apologize. Um I'm, I'm trying to bring it back to your point about uh, groups and so, kind of the politics. So projective identification and groups. Yes. And what this does is blank. Okay. So uh, in Bion's work, basically what this does is projective identification becomes a way for people to um, kind of – God, valency types are kind of hard to explain. I apologize. And, and I'm also not the most well-read on everything psychoanalytical. Um, because I guess the way I'm making it sound is valency types are kind of a de determinative typology when they're not. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess the best way to put it, to put it kind of in a political frame here, is so in a group for Bion, there's two things going on simultaneously. There's the work group and there's the basic assumptions. Work group, quite literally, is just the objective of a group, what you're trying to do. And the basic assumptions is almost, I would say almost, um, he called it a common thinking apparatus. So it's kind of the atmosphere of the group. It's It's how it, deal how kind of people deal with being in a group and so the container contained relationship ends up turning into um somebody instead of just relating with an individual contain contain or can contain container you end up relating to a group where the group acts as either the contained or the container and so um So basically, um, projective identification in that sense kind of is uh, a way for somebody to either, well, pretty much a way somebody in, uh, integrates into a group. So we have political parties in the United States. And so projective identification um
I guess I guess it's a hmm. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um So let's let's break down the like three accepted types of projected vivification and then maybe I can maybe you can talk about it. These are not all by Bion, and I'm not a Bion scholar, so I'm just, just pulling this up right. here. There's acquisitive projective identification when someone takes the attributes of someone else versus attri uh, attributed projective objective uh, identification where someone induces someone else to become their own projection. There's projective counter-identification where a therapist unwillingly assumes the feelings and role of the patient to the point that he acts out the role within the therapeutic setting, a step beyond the therapist merely receiving the patient's projections and acting on them, and dual projective identification, a concept introduced by um, Lacar, uh, Joan Lacar, and it primarily occurs between partners and relationships simultaneously project onto one another, both denial of these projections, but both identify with these projections. These uh, have been said to be normal projective identifications and pathological projective identifications, which is where the subject is splintered into minute pieces before the projection takes place. So it seems like the acquisitive one would be the one that applies to group identity formation within the individual. But it's it's not clear to me how this relates to social analysis. I just know yeah. that 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 projective identification was a big part of social analysis for bio. Mm -hmm. Okay, so actually, it's a good thing you broke it down like that. Um, you know, again, apologize for the the the. Um, Losing my train of thought there several times. Okay, so actually those three um, relate very well to what um, Wilfred Bion called his basic assumptions where he has fight and flight, dependency, and um, pairing. Um, mm -hmm. It's not exact. It's not an exact parallel per se. Um, but so generally speaking, um, in Bion's work, um, those are kind of the three basic assumptions that any group ends up in. Dependency is sort of um, kind of Max Weber's uh, charismatic leader sort of thing where you completely are dependent upon one person, at least the, in Bion's analysis, one person for security, safety, a way to go, um, almost like a cult. Um, and then you have, um, <clears throat> and then you have Bion's idea of fight or flight, where basically a group is set up um, either um, to constantly, constantly be in confrontations, um, constantly be fighting, like being in the military, or the flip side of that, which is to constantly be avoiding um, confrontations. Um, and the last one is pairing in which he believed that sometimes groups get together purely for uh, reproduction or um, in our era, it would be just for sexual pleasure, but um, more or less kind of a, a relationship, um, you know, a pairing. Mm -hmm. And so um, to kind of get back to the question you were asking before, um, so that's kind of how, in my opinion, as best as I understand it, that projective identification relates to buy on um, in relationship to groups, more or less. Um, and so, um, so basically, um, I guess if you were to take a Bionian perspective on politics this is I, I guess this is why it's kind of so hard to talk about Bion, and maybe this is why he doesn't get doesn't get traction in america is he's never explicitly political uh in mm -hmm. his work he does bring up politics in a sense sometimes he relates to like when he's talking about uh human groupishness he'll he'll mention that politics is one of the ways in which we enact uh uh human groupishness but he never quite gives any sort of political analysis there as far as i can think 
of there isn't a you know a you know any sort of political analysis which is where this kind of gets difficult um and so more or less what happens i i guess the bionian take on politics would be that there's a a there's a there's a constant um i'll put it this way society as a whole is made up of groups and all of these groups are trying to establish i would say some kind of projective identification with the concept of society which i'm sorry is kind of broad but basically mm -hmm. you know it, it's how we relate to things and um you know, he thinks that the three main ways in which we try to relate to society um, would be through those basic assumptions and how they apply to our ultimate goal in life. So if you have a political organization, let's say that's trying to establish some kind of social program, um, depending on how that society responds to to your work group to your objective your group is going to start to form a basic assumption um based off of almost based off of how to best uh cope with either achieving the goal or not i, I the the achievement of the goal is neither here nor there technically as far as bion's concerned but um kind of the reaction to attempting that goal will create a a desire for a certain kind of basic assumption so if you want social programs and you find somebody let's say a barack obama type of politician who's charismatic and stuff like that you might you know sink into sort of a basic assumption of dependency as long as that guy succeeds doesn't matter and it can also be based on the opposite of that, which, you know, like people's obsession with AOC, where mm -hmm. some people are really into, you know, she's doing great, blah, 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 regardless of evidence. And then there's people who just are always on her about anything and everything. So we have parasocial projective identification there. Right. Yeah. As, especially nowadays. And so um, that that seems to kind of be how, at least my understanding of Bion and politics is, is kind of uh, groups relate to um, society or the idea of society, however you want to look at that, with a projective identification that ends up establishing their basic assumption, um, which can both, which is a way to cope with the achievement or the failure of their objective. Yeah. Um... So why do you think this is so important for modern politics? Because as you say, most, I mean, with the exception of the way Lacan is used um, today, you would notice that most psychoanalytic works are rigorously politically neutral. Yes. Um, in fact, some of them, like Freud, view politics basically with suspicion on almost Nietzschean lines, like... Yeah. Like, right. uh, yeah. you know, uh, politics is, is, you know, almost always false in the Freudian view. It's almost always a manifestation of collective manifestations of the individual death drive or, right. uh, you know, whatever. Um, so, so how would we use this in a non-therapeutic scenario? Because the socio-analysis part of it does imply that it has more than a therapeutic application. Right. Um, well, I was looking up, uh, I was trying to see if anybody had actually used Bion for social theories, and I found only one article in, in the time I had, which kind of, uh, is interesting in and of itself. But the importance of Bion outside of therapy. Well, interestingly enough, I think that Bion's insight about analysts and having the theory get in the way of actually understanding something is actually pretty applicable outside of therapy towards politics. And the reason that that kind of meshes with the whole work group basic assumption aspect 
is that um, so most people when they approach politics are approaching it with certain you know preconceived notions um, you know whether it's based on class uh, sexual orientation how, what have you um, we have a certain way we approach things and so in a non-therapeutic and explicitly political way, Bion would probably, uh, a Bionian perspective would be to try to approach politics um, without that sort of theorizing first. Maybe try to see if you can actually grasp the problems as they are. Um, which, which is almost idealistic um, because... I, I mean, do you ever, you know, uh, grasp something without any preconceived notions is a, uh, is an interesting question, mm. but go ahead. Yeah. But basically, um, that would be the beginning part. And the way that meshes with the work group and the basic assumptions is that when you attempt to grasp something without a theory, without, you know, uh, a specific position, but let's say a theory or an ideology. Um, I think Bion would argue that that would cause for you to, um, let's say, reflect on the the group with 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 which you are within, and the basic assumptions that are part of that group. And I, I guess. In modern politics, you know, with the way everybody's pretty knee jerky and like everything, there's an immediate response. And, you know, in the media, there's an interpretation and an interpretation of an interpretation and so on and so on, you know, forever. Um, the non therapeutic value of Bion, excuse me, in politics, um, if I could put it to a word, it would probably be reflection. Okay. The reflection of group dynamics. Basically, um, for Bion, the 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 thing that Bion's work does is it forces you to reflect on the group dynamics that are pushing things, or or I guess, um, yeah, pushing things, uh, uh, making society go. Um, so so. That, so Different from most uh, psychoanalysts who wrote almost all uh, interactions in the family, for example, as the primary so uh, primary and only real social context that matters, the family, then the love relationship. Right. Um, and different from, uh, say, Jungian psychologists who have who have a a notion of culture, but have like ideas like collective unconscious and yes, ancestral yeah, memory yeah. and right. Yes, absolutely. Uh, very nebulous and frankly deliberately occultic um yes. uh notions about what uh group identity formation really is and what undergirds it and the universality of that. Someone like Bayan's gonna be interesting because Bayan's going to be like group dynamics specific, but larger than just the family. So the family is not the only group dynamic of which we are taking, a uh, Norse childhood either. Right, like childhood is not the only group dynamic of which we are taking note. Um, I think that's interesting because in this project of identification, you have you have what you know what we would talk about as the beginnings of like parasocial theory, even though that doesn't come until the 1950s. Although Bion's alive when that begins, parasocial theory yes. uh, is a product of media analysis in the 1950s, noticing that people who are watching TV heavily began to identify and have one way relationships with um figures on television then we started seeing that there are parasocial relations to like myths and fictional characters and even other people to which you had no obligation um so what i find interesting is you have here conceptual convergence from a lot of different areas and and bion's interesting because you don't see a lot of that i mean you do see a lot of conceptual convergence in a lot of the different areas of psychoanalysis and other parts of scientific worldview which is why people say it's totally anti-scientific or not being totally fair. Mm -hmm. But um, 
it's driving things in a big way. Now, how do you how do you reconcile this with Sartre? Because one of the things that we've talked about before, um, from your own theory, and Sartre's back to territory I feel more comfortable in. Yeah. But the denial of the unconscious versus the subconscious. So the subconscious for people who don't get that subtle distinction, and the distinction is subtle. The subconscious is something of which you are partly aware. You are not actively aware of it, but it exists in your mind. You become you can become aware of it in your conscious mind. Whereas the unconscious is something of which you are completely unaware consciously. And and, and of course, Sartre doesn't make a lot of hay about the subconscious, but he denies the unconscious is even a thing. Yes. Right. Like. Right. Right. And so, um, I am glad you brought this to comfortable. Uh, comfortable territory here <laughs> um so with sartre um the way i reconcile him with bion is so the interesting thing about bion is while he argues that humans are groupish he doesn't deny that individuals have a tendency to you know what he says be at war with their groupishness and so you know the individual is constantly um for example, with um, with the work group, with the objective of the group, you have uh, he argued that you have two two options. You have the freedom of not doing what the group is doing. And you can go do your own thing, which can lead to alienation, um, like the good sides, freedom, bad sides, alienation. But on the other hand, um, if you do cooperate, there's kind of a loss. He calls a loss of distinctiveness which to Sartre and existentialism would be, would be a loss of authenticity. Mm -hmm. And so where they converge is that I think that you could read Sartre's uh, existential psychoanalysis <coughs> as, an, as an attempt to understand a human's desire for authenticity but you could read it as basically an understanding of how we um, wage war on our desire to be in a group. So instead of authenticity being the goal, let's say, of psychoanalysis or human development or even psychological well-being, you would have to argue that authenticity is almost a tool in a sense, to try to wedge, you know, uh, a space between yourself and a group. Which I find to be kind of interesting because the problem with authenticity, and Theodore Adorno, you know, took a jab at this. I haven't read everything he's written. Oh, yeah. Although he's really aiming more at Heideggerians in Germany when he writes uh, the German right. War Theory, and then he has Sartre, who's, who's a little bit Roughly contemporaneous to Adorno, but not really. Right. Like... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know he's he's going after Heidegger, and that's actually something that I always find a little irritating. Is some people read Heidegger, and then when they read Sartre, they read Heidegger's version of authenticity into Sartre, where Sartre, uh, in being a nothingness, is very explicit that he's not really going down the same path as as Heidegger on authenticity. But um, when you unite that with Bion, mm -hmm. it's sort of um, it's it's sort of a way of how do I put this? It, it's sort of a way of explaining how alienation can exist within people who desire to be in a group. If that makes sense. Yeah. So, so the projected belonging into a group does not reduce alienation. And I think this is also key to Lacan. Like Lacan is like basically like his, his weird shit about the sexual relationship yeah. does not exist. And, mm -hmm. and all this is about like the, the, the yearning for group belonging actually often itself our love or conjoining with another person is actually often uh, flips on itself. And it actually becomes a source of, of disenchantment and alienation in of itself. Right. Well, yeah, in, f in fact, if you look at Sartre to, to bring this completely to the individual here. So mm -hmm. in, in Sartre's work at the beginning, um, and people argue that he changes this. I don't I don't think he ever explicitly does so. Mm -hmm. um, 
at least he doesn't do so convincingly. But he argues in being a nothingness that m relationships are essentially sadomasochist. And um, the reason that this is interesting within sort of the um, Bionian uh, interpretation is that um, so so basically um, if if um, if a human relationship is sadomasochistic where as Sartre puts it, one person is trying to um, possess freedom mm -hmm. and one person is trying to be possessed by freedom. Mm -hmm. um, in, in a group, what that means is that, um, at least, again, at least with Bion, is that, um, sorry, so I have to kind of back up here. So when he, when I told you about the, the dilemma to the work group where it's freedom or, mm -hmm. um, you know, loss of distinctiveness. There's also another dilemma that he talks about where um, there's the dilemma for the objective itself. And then there's a dilemma for the basic assumptions in which we integrate ourselves into, or at least are integrated by. And he argues that basically in um, basic assumptions, you can evade reality and kind of accept the the fantasy as he calls it the fantasy the the basic assumption or you can be against it and mm -hmm. possibly become a scapegoat is is the kind of that trade-off and so if you throw in sartre's notion of, of of sadomasochistic relationships um basically what you start to see is that the way people have a sadomasochistic relationship with people, which Sartre argues oscillates, you know, you're not always the sadist and you're not always the masochist. It, it depends on what's going on. Um, you start to see um, that that's kind of the same relationship you have with the group. Um, mm. Where, you know, we may not call it necessarily sadomasochistic, but you, you're, you're kind of in a dilemma where you're either deciding how to submit to a group or its basic assumptions or you're trying to decide how to maintain your distinctiveness in face of uh i wouldn't call it a collective punishment but you know kind of a, a punishment I, I guess collective punishment would work but um you sort of end up having that sadomasochistic relationship with the group mm -hmm. which is kind of a a, a dark way to uh look at it a, a cynical way to look at it um but the reason that's important is because in a sense um that makes authenticity um a let us say an interesting but failed way to deal with that um People who believe in authenticity are often trying to um, – they're often trying to establish their distinctiveness um, as far as you know, my understanding of all this is. Um, they're trying to establish an individuality, a soul, a self, however you want to look at that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's – it ultimately, it, basically, this the within a Bionian understanding, the Sartrean project ultimately fails. Always, you can't be authentic. Um, you can try to be authentic. You can work very hard, but eventually, you're stuck with the the sadomasochistic dilemma. No matter what, you know, are you are you going to submit? to the group or are you going to have to deal with the the punishments of that hmm that's a that's that's an interesting i mean it's a typically french conflation of categories but i i do yes. see that the 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 way in which sadism and masochism and the infliction of power and power dynamics 
would be part of the assertion here, particularly going all the way back to like not only Freud, but in, in Sartre, you're having to deal with the whole phenomenological tradition of Hegel where recognition yeah. and differentiation of self is is all tied into this. And then you yes. add in psychoanalysis as a developed psych, uh, science to fill in the gaps of how that right. would actually work as opposed to like the idea and the substrate or whatever. Yeah. Um, um, uh, so it's an interesting question here is wouldn't a collective punishment require one to have been part of a collective? Well, it can be an imagined collective, right? Yes. Like that's, that's another thing that we have to yeah. deal with is po uh, projective identification when a collective can be imaginary. And so can the punishment that goes yes. along with it. Right. Uh, well, I was, I was about to say, so that's interesting because for Sartre, um, the only way to end so I should say the only way in early Sartre to end sadomasochistic relationships mm -hmm. um, is um, to imagine a third is what, you know, it's the third. Now, uh, the third could be another person. This is what no exit is based off of entirely is the idea that the third person kind of exists there as a way to. Um, like you, you you convince yourself that they're there to, to end the suffering. You focus on the third person, the third thing, or in this case, it would be um, the, the, the collective is the mm -hmm. third. And so. Um, right. This is why we talk yeah. about, even in sociology, collective uh, fictional collective unities versus aggregates, because they're not really the same thing. The collect the, the, the collective image acts as a, it, we treat the the image of the collective almost as if it was an individual person, right? Um, yeah. Whereas, um, and and thus serves the function of a third party and, and, and our mediator in the relations, mm -hmm. a, and the raw aggregate is yeah. actually just the raw statistical rules that emerge from individual interactions, and I. I bring this up. It's it's it's. This is not the way Sartre or Byron would talk. By the way, this is yes. this is me imposing, um, uh, kind of Marxian and systems language on it. But there's a reason why we are always very careful when we talk about um, aggregates and like movements of classes and aggregate or mass movements versus collectives, because collectives tend to have a collective self-image, and that collective self-image has a psychologically predetermined function. It's often, frankly, not healthy, but it, it's there. And th I bring this up because it's important to some of the stuff that EndNotes was using Bion for. That's why Bion was useful for them. It's because they used a lot of this stuff to talk about stuff that had come up in analytic Marxism and in systems theory to deal with the collective, uh, the collective image and the imagined collective versus the real aggregate. Right. Um, anyway. So hopefully people aren't totally confused by that interjection, but I think right. it will help some of the questions you're getting. Right. Um, so it still doesn't seem how this is super useful for socialists, except that we can already see maybe a tendency for socialists to, in creating a third in this Sartrean language, mm -hmm. uh, create create an image of a collective that reflects themselves and project back upon that in, in a way uh, that both hides, hides their own power dynamics in that, mm -hmm. but also like does not actually reflect the reality or even the aggregate reality of, of most people's experience. Mm. Right. Right. Well, that's not so I much you're buying, though. Oh, right. Well, so I will actually approach this. Um, from Sartre to Bayon. I'll, I'll, okay, let's I'll do that. Come back to Bayon. So there's uh, there was a paper written about what a Sartrean critical theory could be. It's by somebody named John Duncan. Um, he called it a pure critical theory. Mm. But basically, in the ultimate analysis, he argued that a Sartrean critical theory would be focused on um, the subject and subjection, kind of how the subject creates themselves, but is also created by the world. This is what, uh, you know, the critique of dialectical reason ultimately uh, uh, struggles with, ultimately is grappling with. Mm -hmm. And so um, what is helpful with Bion is for Sartre, the individual kind of 
the individual is definitely alienated in a Sartrean universe. Mm -hmm. um, I would even argue that Sartre goes up almost almost goes against his idea that existence precedes essence because he considers the individual hopelessly alienated. Like there, there's for him, it, it you know, there's almost no way out. Um, later on, he argues that recognition from the other is, is a way out. But it, it, to me, it's not entirely convincing. Um, yeah, so but that what for people don't catch that that actually does imply that there's a the alienation is essential which is stated to be in lacan but that goes against existentialist um yes a doctrine that there's nothing essential to the human being right absolutely and um you know it, it almost it's almost as if for sartre the human condition is essentially alienated beings making choices mm. is kind of the the essence which um he's not supposed to have but all oh, those french philosophers but um largely speaking so back to the critical theory basically there's the the subject and subjection mm -hmm. and what what uh what bion offer offers is a way for the Sartrean subject to understand how it is that their subject is uh, influenced by the world. Because at least in my reading of uh, the critique of dialectical reason, um, Sartre argues that the material conditions influence the individual, but I don't remember him going into exactly how that is. It just seems to be asserted because he's a Marxist and he's right. going to say it. Like, yeah, it. Well, yeah, like like his idea of dialectical circuality. Or, right. I, I'm not saying that correctly, but, um, you know, he just he says, you know, we make the things that make us is basically what he says. Now, with right. Bion, Bion would say, well, the reason these things make us, which we then in turn make or other way around, is that thinking is not an isolated uh, phenomenon. It is something that we gain from our relationship with people and our ultimate tendency to be groupish animals. Right. And so what that adds to, let's say, to a socialist take is that what we have to understand um, is that propaganda or information or the the traditions of a society or even the culture if you want to go that far is something that we are born into which kind of creates um how do i put this molds the subject as the subject is trying to overcome it so um again i'm not as well read on marxism so if i say something misstep my bad but i'll make sure you know <laughs> right um, so basically, um, one could argue that when people are, 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 one is born, especially nowadays into a bourgeois culture, mm -hmm. into a bourgeois society. And so the Bionian take would be like, would, would, would probably state that basically as soon as you're born, your relationship with your caretaker, your mother, eventually your friends and the vehicle groups are constantly being um, molded and sculpted by the culture that exists before you get there, mm -hmm. which is actually a concept that Sartre is, struggles with, with critique of dialectical reason. It's that, that, you know, for him, the way he put it is that there's uh, the structure of material conditions exist before you're born into it. Mm -hmm. A good example is when you're born and you're in a family, let's say you're in a Christian family, the first time you get taken to a church, you probably don't understand what it's what it's about what or understand its importance. But as you go there and you live your life and you slowly but surely keep going back, you know, so on and so on, um, it, it kind of, you know, you, you kind of learn that it's kind of sculpted. It's part of your schedule. You know, mm -hmm. it's got, you know, every Sunday or however you do that. And so for Bion, your thinking, your thinking apparatus is sculpted in this way. Mm. And so ultimately the reason for, as I, uh, as I said before, the reason that 
the great political message of buy on is reflection is because you have it, be, because you know um even the new generation doesn't have new ideas they're taking in old ideas ideas that already exist the material you know they're they're relating to uh to material conditions that are sculpting the way that they view the world and so you're you're you know for for a socialist program you you have to basically reflect on how that affects you why it affects you that way and then you you are in my opinion you're forced to take in the the historical forces that led to that point you can't you can't just be a social you can't just like this is what you're saying the difference between class movement and and, and collectives are you can't just be a socialist i guess in a bionian take you can't just go be a socialist join a group because in a sense you're joining that group based upon the the basic assumptions the dependency yeah, you're fighting. a product of your own society and right. you cannot make, i mean the, the the dialectical circularity that you were talking about in sartre comes from the quote in marx you know men make the world but not of their own choosing yeah um and and but you know and the idea that we are constantly constructing both our social and our superstructural uh material base in a way that changes us um in reaction to it but as we build it it's also like each thing is shaping the way we relate to each other and thus our relations are reflected in that and yes. so just joining a group would with unreflectively Mm -hmm. would would lead you into recapitulating a lot of those ideas and and whatnot into the social organization particularly if it doesn't come out of something organic within the society itself this is the marxist point about like right like the socialist movement doesn't emerge from the working class but it has to join it because mm -hmm. you know um right yeah because both things are kind of incomplete w without w without each other according to marx like and there's a lot of stuff that there's a lot of Hegelian stuff in early Marx that kind of makes this a little questionable. Yes. But I, I'm just I'm just pointing out what's going on here. And it's interesting that Sartre, despite his critique of dialectical reasoning in general, uh, maintains that. Yes. But I, I guess you can kind of see it in Bion, too, even though he's not. He, Bion's coming from this Freudian Nietzschean psycho psycho psychoanalytic British British yes. psychoanalysis. Uh, British psychology, early neurology standpoint, right? right. Like it's a, it's a very different standpoint, right? And he's he's almost uh, uh, a quick comment on Bion. He's almost Kantian, is mm. is how I've read him because so he has the concept. So I I, I should put it this way. So um, and this is the stuff that I I forgot before when I was searching my thoughts here. So. When you have the projective identification that starts with the container contained with your family and, or well, mm -hmm. with your, your mother and it goes on. He argued that you have three relationships to the world that all have negatives to them or, you know, negations. You have love, hate, and knowledge, mm -hmm. which you can have the lack of love, the lack of hate and lack of knowledge. And so with, um, with you know kind of the what you're pointing out where it's kind of a, a Nietzschean psychological uh take on this um the um oh good god lost my Jesus Christ. um Nietzsche's psychological take on this yes, yes. um I apologize. Um, the um, what were we talking about before that? I apologize. Um, we let me backtrack. Um, we were talking about uh, the the Sartrean the, circu uh, circularity that's relationship to Marxism. The idea that you, you that you never come to a group or whatever outside of a social context, that social context is carried into the group. Even if it's against that social context, if you're unreflective, you will mirror it, recreate it, et cetera, and so forth. Right. That's what we're okay. talking about. All right. Um, okay. So, oh yeah, I, we, I was talking about Kantian. Got it. Yeah. Okay. You called by so, Kantian and I was trying yeah, to figure out why. Right. So, yeah. So um, to kind of explain the um, 
perspective he takes. My apologies again. So he has a letter for our relationship, um, and to, for our relationships, hate, love, and knowledge. Right. And which he develops in relationship to our thinking apparatus and our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, he ends up sort of taking um, these and saying that they don't just relate to people. You know, he takes it out of the group dynamics and he says that they relate to an absolute, an, which he signified with the letter O, an absolute truth. Mm -hmm. because the the ultimate thing for Bion is the ability he think he thought that you can't have mental and emotional growth unless you can grasp the truth which uh in our postmodern era almost sounds ridiculous but right. um although it's interesting because um Sartre doesn't say as much but he kind of is of the same position um he, he doesn't say it in his works, but in the biography of uh, Annie Sol Cohen, um, mm. he remarks many times that basically he believed in the idea of one truth that has like a bunch of different perspectives that we're always trying to reconcile. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but, but to kind of go to your point about how that relates to, let's say, political analysis and... Um, sort of uh collectives and groups is that for for Bion um it's the the we, we basically for him the culture that we grow up in the thoughts that we develop the thinking apparatus that we get created in this case by a bourgeois culture mm -hmm ultimately obscures us from what the truth would be now um he never really remarks on what the truth is because he's he's not really doing political analysis and, and it's hard to relate the notion of truth to politics mm -hmm. but um ultimately um he I, I guess the, the interesting thing about his proposition that you can't just go, join a group. In fact, it, it, it's kind of a, it's kind of like when you're listening to people who call themselves socialists and what they're saying is just so out of whack. And you, you know, you, you have to wonder why that is if they understand everything. And um, for, for him, um, I guess the best I can do is what I was saying before, where the, the great beginning of politics for Bion is the reflection of those basic assumptions and, and the thinking apparatus which we use. And so how this relates to socialists, maybe trying to deal with a, a modern world, there are so many different ways to influence us. There's a constant assault on the subject subjection of the subject in any mm -hmm. culture and so um the the thing for socialists and using let's say using bion is that you kind of have to do a deep dive into culture and the historical forces that lead up to um the present day and show how that um, – you're forced to reflect upon how that thinking sort of um, determines, let us say, the type of socialism that's, that's sprouted. Because like for example, when you say socialist in America, it doesn't mean the same thing as, I don't know, socialism in Europe or socialism in Asia. It, it tends to kind of have – um, socialism and welfare state characteristics. Yes. Although right. I would I would argue that it probably <laughs> that that's probably true in more of the world than people are comfortable with. But yes, well, yes, right. And and you know, it's not to say necessarily that every culture more or less has a, a unique way, but they they usually have. I guess for here, I just thought of how to put this. Okay, so for Bion, the political project let's say the political program that you would have to apply to the socialist movement would be to reflect upon the 
the thinking apparatuses that inform your movement and probably the movement of enemies as well or, or people that you don't agree with. And you have to figure out how those things are reproduced. Um, which, oddly enough, I know Aldous Huxley is more considered more of a communitarian than a leftist. Um, mm -hmm. But it kind of goes to um, kind of the notion of propaganda and how propaganda, technology, parasocial relationships, things like that. Um, you kind of have to approach those and see not only how they structure your thoughts now, mm -hmm. um, but how they can be used to restructure those thoughts, uh, th those thinking apparatuses. Um, because, for example, uh, Brave New World and then Aldous Huxley's last novel, Island. Mm -hmm. The societies in both those books are the same. Mm -hmm. the, Aldous Huxley went to pains to make sure that they're structured the same. They've got the same kind of – they're just in different places geographically with, I would assume, different cultures. Mm -hmm. And so um, basically his point was to show that you know you can't get rid of propaganda because, I mean, if you have information, you're going to have propaganda. You can't get rid of technological advances and you know pharmacological – you know, uh, attempts to deal with disease and so on. But it does matter how you use it, I guess, is, is the best way to put that. And so for Bion, the analysis of that wouldn't be necessarily how you use it. It would be the thinking apparatus that allows you to grapple with <clears throat> those structures in society. I see. So yeah. there, there's a fair amount there, but... So yeah. basically, very similar to, you know, a, a lot of maybe even Marxist ideas, the, the terrain on which you operate on very much informs how you're going to operate in it. And you cannot completely remove yourself from that baggage. Um, it's kind of implied in some Marxist things, too. For example, like in the Critique of the Earth program, Marx says, like, you, you really can't remove all bourgeois forms of... of uh, of organization now unfortunately he doesn't state which ones have to stay and which ones don't this is yeah. to tons of debates and but regardless that you can't get rid of all that just by will and you'd have to build a little bit of society that moves away from that and you know early stage socialism and then a little more late stage socialism then a lot right. more through the dictatorship of the proletariat on through and until you you, you develop you know, um, non-class relations entirely, mm. right? Right. So, so you have that scenario there, and there's a fair amount to deal with in that. But I mean, it seems pretty clear to me um, that that does spell out a lot of. It has a lot of different implications, um, honestly, for for what you're dealing with here. And someone like Bion, again, not from any kind of Marxist political perspective or. Maybe in a perspective that we can totally even agree with, because Bion's positing something like unalienated uh, absolute truth that you can know. Yes. As opposed to, uh, like Marx, who believes in unalienated absolute truth, but whether or not you can actually know it in Marx is a completely different perspective. Right. Right. Like, um, so um, this relationship to truth seems somewhat harder for us to, to deal with. And not just because of postmodernism. I mean, like, there's right. a lot of ways in which like developments in science have have led to, you know, I, I think I'll, yeah, as a side note, I've always thought a lot of people have have the order of operations backwards on the problems of postmodernism. They blame like they blame the problems of postmodernism on postmodernism and not the conditions that led postmodernism to be an attractive explanation for the contemporary society at the time. Right. And thus they have a scapegoat to kick for the failures of Marxism other than, you know, Marxist not promising in most of the world, uh, not delivering on the promise that they made. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Right. Which, you know, it seems like uh, all of a sudden postmodernism is a good scapegoat for that. Right. Instead of you saying, well, it's our fault that we can do this or, mm -hmm. you know, or, or it couldn't be done or we were promised or we didn't understand something. We say, oh, well, this new stupid 
um, philosophy emerged, but then you don't say yeah. why it emerged. Right. Um, or you just say, oh, it's bourgeois ideology. And I'm like, yeah, of course it is. But so is everything. Right. So yeah. like, um, it's kind of like, this is, I'm getting on a rant and I'm a little tired, but it's kind of like when, when I have this problem with both post leftists and anti leftists and left communists talk about, uh, you're part of the left of capital as if in the developed world you could be part of something else. Right. Like, um, I mean, maybe you could argue that maybe in China, Vietnam, Cuba, you aren't part of left capital, although I, I you know, as I pointed out, they still have bourgeoisie, so you know, whatever. Yes, yes, right. Um, uh, but but in our country, it, it literally doesn't mean anything to say you're not part of it. Like that's that's you signaling some ideational difference that there's nothing for you to attach it to. It's totally projective. Right. So like instead of making such a lame ass claim, you should just argue that we should you know be a better kind of left and not just do this whole like distancing projective identification project counter identification right. project. Right. B basically. Um to kind of put that in Bionian terms here, terms here to maybe kind of bring this together a little bit better. Mm -hmm. A lot of people treat the left either as an idea or as a group um, as a container for their, um, let's say that for their negative, um, I don't want to say emotions, let's say negative perceptions that are formed because of their material conditions. You know, mm -hmm. because, you know, you're dealing with, uh, you know, not being able to pay the rent or, you know, getting, you know, various different things. And what they do is they look at the left and and, you know, the the, the left or their idea of the left doesn't make sense. It doesn't work with what's going on. It's not delivering the things that they think it should deliver. And so. um since it can't contain those negative perceptions, it, it's they kind of take what you were saying, kind of take an immature tactic mm -hmm. where they ignore the left and they say, oh, well, it's postmodernism. And then, you know, it's, it's postmodernism. It's these dumb philosophies. It's kind of like that argument where people have that, where they're like, oh, we don't need theory or, oh, we really need theory. And, you know, it, kind of praxis versus theory thing as far as i understand it um yeah are, and, are they like we'll posit some other subject in the developing world or over there but there's more left and again even people who are saying well that's not true are also playing a counter identification game honestly yes, right because because what they're doing is like well you can't say that because these people over here on this so we have to do with the left and what we do it right but the left as it is projected is the left is not a thing Yes. All right. It is it, it, it is it is a group of people with a specific orientation at best. All right. Right. Um, it's 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 a it's almost only it's almost like a quasi collective where right. people are trying. I, I feel like a lot of um, here. Here's the use of buy on for me with the left is I feel like a lot of times you'll see people fight and you'll be able to understand what's going on because you see different basic assumptions in conflict mm -hmm. you have the people who want to be leftists who want us to go after every person canceling people things like that kind of a what Bion would call fight or flight where we're either always fighting people or we you know we're always kind of avoiding certain confrontations or, or avoiding mm -hmm. certain topics and then you have people who want us to be completely dependent on certain people and sometimes this can be a theorist this can be a politician. This can be a leader. Um, it's usually an individual that they fetishized in some way. And, right. So you know, the, the, the the fetish canons of of the left, be they in actual states or in like his theoretical. Right. Uh, you know, Lenin, Marx, Trot, Trotsky, Mao, Hoja, who the fuck ever. But yeah, yeah. Right. And and so those kind of people want you know complete dependency. And then for for pairing, a um, little more difficult to discern, um, I would say. I'd have to read far more by on to understand exactly what he was getting at with pairing. But my understanding of it is it's kind of those people who uh, treat um, – they kind of treat the left as an attempt at community 
and only community? Ah, uh, yes. The people who like I, I become an activist because that community fills the gap of, mm -hmm. of all these other communities, like right. the, the religious home or whatever that, right. that and, I couldn't belong to. Right, absolutely. And and what you'll see with each of these basic assumptions, and, and this is again, this is how Bion works for me, is what you'll see with ba these basic assumptions is let's take postmodernism since we we're talking about that. Yeah. You will you will see that these basic assumptions will condemn the same idea in different ways, in ways that protect the basic assumption so that you can keep indulging in it without having to stop and reflect, as Bion would ask you to do, to kind of reflect on the basic assumptions. So for pairing, for example, what is postmodernism? It's a thing that tears up communities. It's a thing that, you know you know, uh, attacks the family. I know that's kind of more of a right wing thing, but you know, no, but you do have leftists who, who, who care about it, such as, uh, you know, you could see late Christopher Lash being really concerned about right. this. Or, right. Know. And so, you know, things like that. And then with the basic assumption for dependency, what is postmodernism? It's the, it's, you know, kind of, uh, de uh, delegitimizing, uh, delegitimizing. Yeah. The authority. delegitimizing of the authority of the meta narrative of the revolutionary subject. Right. Or Lin exactly. Or yeah. And, and so right. then, you know, people are like, Oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to deal with that. And then you have, um, fight or flight. And I mean, what is postmodernism? If everything's relative, you know, technically, you know, as far as people's, um, a lot of people will go after postmodernism for relativity. Yeah, which and, is, which is also kind of funny because right, postmodernism is not unique in that remotely. Right, exactly. And and so for people who are fight or flight, if everything's relative, then there's nothing to fight. That because technically, you would have to approach something by a different perspective. And so what they what they tend to do, in my opinion, is they tend to kind of go the puritanical. Well, it may not be, you know, the only way to look at things, but it's the right way to look at things. And so then they close off debate on, you know, the various other topics. Right. Yeah. So, and that, so this would be the people who would who would cite, you know, ex-communist theorist as scripture as if that settles any economic or right. social question. Yeah. Right. And maybe maybe Bion is not good for the socialist project in the sense that if we were to ever create an American left or, or international left, because we would have worked through our basic assumptions, but maybe for the moment while things are, you know, disintegrated and maybe this goes on forever. I don't know, but while, you know, while they're, you know, I, I ascribe to, you know, the idea that there's no left there's leftists. And mm. so for right now, while there's no group uh, and there's only imagined collectives, maybe Bion's helpful because, you know, when we approach something, it allows us to kind of uh, look back and kind of consider, well, you know, what are the basic assumptions that we have that are leading to this type of thought? Mm. What, you know, what, what is it, what are the type of thinking, sorry, what are the types of thinking that are embedded in our culture, as far as Bion would be concerned, that are, you know, kind of coming up and informing these uh, assumptions um, that we then, I, I guess, then take as truths, take as uh, absolutes. Yeah, you know, I, I actually think a lot of, there's an interesting thing I was thinking about today because it came up in my response, not to the Spotify Finago or... Our, my response to something like the Chappelle show, Finagle, or whatever cultural day you 50 minute hate and moral panic that we're going to have mm -hmm. at any given yes. time, where we start using consumer pressure to do this because we know our. We'll first talk about talk about the need for censorship or protection and then talk about consumer pressure and then we'll do that. And then people mm -hmm. will say, oh, but this isn't censorship because it's private, which mm -hmm. there, of course, is technically correct, but we all know as a Martin Bailey, because the first thing asked for was actually for regulation, which is not private. Uh, right. All this actually, though, doesn't serve anything political at all because, mm -hmm. because what it fills in the gap for is the inability to deliver anything positive, right? And so this is a projective reinforcement mechanism. But it's maladaptive. I'm going to use that terminology here advisedly in so much that it's more about confirming our own identity and Bion's useful for this and then projecting it onto the world than it is about actually changing people's minds. And this is yes. where what you're talking about and, you know, with Sartre and Austin Sixers overlaps with this more 
hard edge systems theory stuff that I've been talking about, particularly from you know thinkers like uh, William Lynch, which generation warfare, John Boyd, uh, the OODA loops, and stuff like that, where people forget that in a war of ideas, you are fighting for the uncommitted not the people who already share your habitats and world space. Yes. Right. You're not also, you're not fighting for the oppositely committed. And this is the mm. other mistake. This is what leads to like right wing tailism on the left. And like, Oh, you know, you, you see this on post and anti leftist where it's like, they start praising Tucker Carlson or some shit and calling him a good socialist or whatever. And, and this has effects. I mean, the effect in the United States is right now that these, these mutual two tactics together have led to, Tucker Carlson being the most, I mean, I just read something that it said that at least according to one poll, it's hard to say it's a good point off one poll, that Tucker Carlson's the most watch pundit, even for Democrats. Now, it's impossible to know how much of that is hate watching. It's impossible. But regardless, right. hate watching hasn't helped in the past. Yes. And then when you point out to people that, okay, you you successfully deplatformed Alex Jones and Trump, and yet the big lie scenarios and all that have actually spread and expanded uh, uh, quite a bit without even leftists and liberals knowing that it was happening because yes. they're no longer in contact with those people. Um, this is where the psychological mechanisms and this, you know, these group identifications and this projective identification things can be really damaging to you actually being able to achieve your goal, which is the reason why I bring it up. Yeah. Um, and it seems like a stretch at first, but if you're thinking about you know, your goal, if you think about removing the alienation and, and coming to some conclusion, you have to do so in the context in which you live. Denying parts of the context in which you live for reasons of projective identification to shore up your identity is a strategy to both make yourself inabil unable to take in new information and thus see the truth mm -hmm. and unable to operate effectively to disrupt other actors who are more aware of the of the psychological dynamics and predilections of the uncommitted. And so, you know, and all this actually serves a psychological function more than it does an actual political one. Um, uh, and that worries me because, you know, every, you know, for example, people doubling down on, you know, quote, progressive tactics and social shaming, all that you're, you, you were, you, you're, you're beginning to see that become unpopular even amongst, you know, part of the left that wasn't criticizing it. Um, for example, the catch, the council culture wars have abated for a while, you know, um, partly because it's clear that a, the right wing was talking out of its butt and it's totally willing to censor everything. So now we see, go back to anti-censorship positions among the left, but B also because it's become clear to people, they didn't really have the power to enforce it, but every now and then, uh, because they don't have like, even with the Democrats having governmental power or whatever, they can't really do anything. So you see these consumer activist things bubble up in lieu of an actual political fight. And again, it serves a psychological function. And sometimes in this disarray, like you were talking about, right, this would be useful for internal coherence. But if it's at the cost of, of winning over the uncommitted, it's not useful at all. Right. It's, it's, it's literally pathological from a, like a psychoanalytic or... Yeah. yeah, a psychoanalytic perspective. Absolutely, because it's interesting you say all of that because there's there's two things that came to mind for me. So the first thing that came to mind for me is, so when Bayon talks about a group um, and when he talks about the work group and the basic assumption, the way he unites, he explains this relationship is he says that in a group, there's two things that are going on. Um, there's the group mentality, which some people would call like the group will. It's the kind of the the shared – Sartre would call it uniform praxis. It's like what everybody's doing. You know. So if, you know, if you're in the army, everybody's doing marches. Everybody's doing you know, PK or whatever. You know, everybody's doing something. It, that's the group mentality. And then there's the group culture. For Bion, there's no group culture. Unless there is dissent, unless there are individuals within the group that don't identify either with the basic assumptions or the, the work group of what's going on in the group. Um, if they don't identify with either of those, um, he argues that 
there becomes a culture to attempt to maintain the unity that couldn't be maintained through having everybody do more or less the same thing. And it's kind of a, a good example is Full Metal Jacket when mm. they have that, you know, they have certain people who aren't living up to standards and, you know, they beat the shit out of, uh, what's his name, Pile with uh, 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 pillowcases with soap. Um, basically, you know, for Bion, the culture of violence is is what is used or or discipline or over the top kind of attacks is used to maintain what otherwise can't be maintained because piles not living up to the standards of the whatever they're doing right so, the, so this is actually uh this is a point that overlaps with my point on system theory with complexity theory so when something becomes over complex you have to simplify it and there's a tendency to go to violent strongmen to do it which actually tends to actually accelerate the disintegration of the system because the yeah. violence might buy you time but it also tends to invest so much into this one individual figures when the individual figures inevitably dies um you know if only from natural causes uh the system starts to corrode very very fastly i mean like incredibly fastly um and and the simplification that the strongman seemed to do wasn't real. Yes. Um, so violence substitutes a functional system. Also, these cultural battles substitute for a functional politics in a similar that, way. That's what I was actually about to bring up. So for Bion, if he was looking at our culture um, and our, our, uh, our I, I should say our, our society, he would notice that the culture is culture wars. It's a constant battle about anything and everything. And he would argue that this is because the group mentality isn't there. And, right. you know, and, and that seems obvious to a lot of people. But it, it, to me, there's a lot of people I talk to where they'll state something like that. Oh, we don't agree on whatever. You know, there's people who don't like how things are going. Right. But but they also don't miss the group mentality is also not there amongst the side that they're projecting. They're regulating. Like, right. Like, right. Like. like like when I ask people, like, what the hell do you mean by the left in the United States? And they go, well, there is no left. Okay, fine. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's an ideological typology, meaning it's right. an ideal type. And I don't know what you mean unless you state what you mean by left anyway. So that's useless. Yes. Um, right. Uh, are they'll, you know, point to this, that, and the other. And I'm always like, well, I don't identify with those people. I don't agree with them, but I'm not going to say they're not on the left because socially speaking, right. they're perceived as such. They think they're such. And while they don't meet my definition of why I think I am on the left, I can't exclude right. them, you know, just because I don't like them basically. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, if, and, yeah. and if I excluded everybody I didn't like, there'd be nobody here, but me. <laughs> so. <laughs> right. And, and what I find interesting, and this is where um, I also combine Sarcha with uh, Bion. Mm. So Sarcha's view of groups is a little, I'm not going to say primitive. It's kind of simple though. Um, he argues that groups are formed by thirds and, he argues that those thirds tend to have to be a, a threat of some kind. Okay. Um, and so I think Bion brings a little complexity to this because um, more or less um, the um, sorry, it's okay. sister's dog is go away. Um, so basically, um, dogs happen. Yeah. Uh, basically, the uh, uh, let me let me take the culture wars because I, I think I'm a little bit better with specifics than abstracts here. So with the culture wars, Sartre would argue that often, um, whichever side you're on on the culture war, you take uh, whatever is your opposite, mm. quote unquote, and you project it as being out there. It's not a part of society. It's, you know, it's when people get up and they go, oh, this is not what America is. Right. I literally had someone today talking about how all red staters were, uh, and, and quote, Bible builders were monsters and that they mm -hmm. don't have COVID problems on the West Coast. And, right. And, and they literally were in denial when I flashed up the, the stats uh, for, for COVID. I'm like, look, there's no correlation, actually, right. between death rates 
and whether or not you're a red or blue or purple state. In fact, the highest the highest efforts are in purple states. Yes. Um, with the exception of Florida. Yeah. And and when you look at other correlative factors, age, um, education level, and right. relative wealth, right? Um, only one of those is a well, two of them are kind of proxies to politics, but not strongly. One of those is a strong proxy to politics, which is education yes. level. Um, what you see immediately is that those factors are more explanatory than any political factor, and yet. I just got told by this person that those people were monsters and you couldn't reason with them. And then I was like, yes, what do you do? Like, well, what do you do with that? Because th I'm also saying to these people, you are losing the, you are losing the political battle on every front and not attracting a, a, another left battle to fight because you literally are writing off, not just people who disagree with you, but anyone in proxy to them as literal troglodyte monsters who you right. can't reason with. Yeah, well, I was going to say this is like that that story I told at the beginning with the Catholic priest where you show them you show them the right thing and then they repeat the old definition. Mm -hmm. And so um where this intersects with Sartre and uh Bion is that um if we assume with Bion <clears throat> that culture uh, or group culture we'll say, maybe not exactly all culture, but let's say group culture is what happens when the mentality of a um, place is uh, there's dissent. Mm -hmm. And then we accept with Sartre that the way that we at we attempt to unify everybody is by taking that issue and projecting it outward. You know, you project it on something beyond the third. What ends up happening is... Um, at least in my opinion, we begin, uh, in my opinion, we begin to identify with the problem we just projected as right. opposed to the group in which we argue we are based from in dealing with that problem. So this, so, so, uh, and to put this into to perspective yeah. for people who get how this might apply here, what you have a shift is from positive political identification with a positive political program and a group of which you possibly identify to negative identif political identification uh, or negative social identification just in general, but here it would be specifically political because you can't do anything. And because you haven't unified the group and because you don't have an actual politics in any real way. Um, and it, it is telling this is still happening under democratic leadership, right? Yes. Uh, um, that what this means is for most of these people um, all you can do is maintain negative partnership because the only thing that confirms your identity is not that as yes. opposed to I know what I am. I can construct it in this group as functional and can deliver on the goods in which it serves. Right. So like this Bayern is incredibly useful for this. And th this is where I picked up a, a concept from EndNotes. This is not from Bayern, but useful. Where I said last year, people were talking about there's mass politics. And I'm like, there's mass politics in the sense that there is mass negationary movements from um, on both the left and the right, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whether they be um, Rust Belt insurrections for George Floyd uh, or whether they be Jan Sixers. Um, one of those is much larger than the other, but they're the first one. But but right. still, there there is some sort of mass almost anti-politics in that yes um but of the, uh, one can come around a figure but doesn't really have a coherent politics beyond that if you look at like what the right they're not even all white nationalists like they're yes they right. don't have that consistent of an identity right um and then on the other side you see that once blm and all this was incorporated into some kind of positive politics it kind of uh, even new york times is now reporting was a little bit grifty and has been totally re recuperated by the democrats um, what you see there then is a longing for returning to that negative politics because it gave you a sense of identity and inclusion and something to do, but it never turns into a positive politics, which is the reason why like the riot is different from the strike. Um, yes. and, um, and all this, you know, riots kind of have demands, but not really. They're just like, I'm going to tear the shit down. Yes, um, right. Um, and until you stop yes. basically, and whereas, you know, and, and that's a crucial distinction here, right? Psychologically, tactically, professionally, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 
what we see then now is like those aren't truly positive mass movements like you saw at the beginning of the 20th century. Actually, mm-hmm. what they are, I, I actually think Endnote's conception of them as non movements is actually is actually better because what it is is eruptions of stasis. And if this is going yes. back to like ancient Greek concepts. There's so many right. factors that are not that are not that are that are at odds that the group no longer can function and move and do anything and all it can do is erupt in the paroxysm right. of telling itself right apart. well I, I was gonna just add real quick um that in in bionian terms ba- basically what that is is people surrender the objective the work group whatever you're trying to do for indulging in the basic assumption um Bingo. yeah yeah it, yeah and, and so when you have the negative identification when you have the i'm sorry well when you have the identification with the negative, right. what happens is the group that, continues to counter projection is what it's technically yeah, called. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A counter, pro- um, a counter projection. Basically what happens is, um, Oh no, that's group... specifically a therapist. Never mind. I don't want to yeah. mislead people in this terminology. I'll oh no, speak. it's, it's all right. Well, and, and also I, I have to admit that my grasp, I, I have a great grasp of Sartrean terminology, but not as much not in, british in, not british specific psychoanalysis yeah, <laughs> yeah. right it, well and also with with bion i've i've read a good deal of what he has written but there there's a part of my brain when he gets to the more esoteric stuff i just start like rejecting certain things because i i don't know that that's kind of the person i am i don't care for the esoteric but um but back to the point so so you're not liking the okay uh the OKHL parts of Bion. <laughs> I, 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 well, I understand. Well, here, uh, uh, interestingly enough, so when you're talking about uh, rejecting things and ignoring things, mm-hmm. so the the hate, love, knowledge aspect of of um, Bion without the absolute truth mm-hmm. is actually very helpful because, for example, uh, he's he points out basically that in order to indulge in knowledge, you have to recognize that you don't know something. And in the case of like the person you were talking to, uh, and or you show evidence, you say, "Listen, this is what's actually going on." The reason that person is so able to reject it is because they take their ignorance as knowledge, as a, as a buffer between what right. you just said, what they think. Which and, it should concern us because this shows up, uh, Charlie, right. in a lot of ways. Like, like for example, belief in. And climate change has actually decreased among skeptics the worse and more undeniable climate change is. Belief in COVID has decreased in the general public the longer COVID lasts. All right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I say this as a person who literally has it right now. And the only reason I'm talking to you is because I'm isolated in a room through a computer. Right. And and like I sound very animated, but as soon as I stop, I'm gonna go collapse. Yeah. Um but but still, like I could also say because I can see this in myself, for example, right? right? I did everything you're supposed to do. I followed all the things for two years. I wore an N95 mask before it was cool. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> I I um, washed my hands regularly. Back in the time when they told you to spray everything down, which was based on ba- it was not just based on early research; it was based on bad research. Um, uh, I did that too, and. And while I ha- because of that, I know I'm going to have a milder form of COVID, and I am. That's why I can talk to you, and I'm not just dead over there. Right. Um, right. But um, I also know that a lot of people, it would be very tempting to go, well, I did everything right. I still got it. Fuck you. Right? Yes. And, and thus, it becomes easier to buy into the counter narrative. Like, some of the first people I knew who denied COVID exist- existing were people who got COVID in the first two months. Like you've literally had the disease, but yeah. it's just, it's, it's this mechanism that you're talking about. Like, like you take your, you take your ignorant in confrontation of con and we not use this term because it's not used by Bion, but it is what we use in modern psychology to talk about this in confrontation with cognitive dissidents and, and a, thus a threat to your identity, terror management kicks in and you just don't want to deal yes. with. And, and what I'm finding that's so interesting about Bion as you describe it, Bion, from the standpoint of British psychoanalysis, actually has come to the same conclusions as terror management theory. Mm-hmm. Well, right. yes, right. And, and so um, basically, Bion, for me, um, I have a tendency to simplify things. So good. Um, 
yeah. But I have a tendency to overcomplexify we, things. So. Well, well, and and that's actually kind of why I was having a little bit of trouble earlier because I was like I was trying to talk about things from the Bionian perspective only and use the terminology, and I was like, eh, d- anyway. Mm-hmm. But Bion's almost his entire theory is based upon the fact that people can see the truth and reject it. And I replace his kind of Kantian version of that with Sartre and bad faith because I think it works better. Mm. But generally speaking, um, that that th- seems to be the entire basis of his project. But what he does that Sartre doesn't do is he allows for that to exist within a group. Um which is where his group dynamics are based off of. That's why the group dynamics are based on basic assumptions <laughs> in, in the in the group work or the group mentality and the group culture. You know, he's kind of noticing that kind of, uh, let's call it a paradox, where I can interact with a group, but I can try to maintain a certain individuality that rejects uh, certain aspects of reality, really. And the thing about Bion, a lot of people read Bion in the same way that they read Jung, where they're kind of mystical and they kind of, it's a, it's a way to make themselves feel better. And, so they're the problem, doing what Bion's literally describing that they would do. Yes. yes. And, and, and that's what's interesting because if you read Bion cr- closely, especially, especially with his analysis of groups, he's telling you that basically, like I said, with the basic assumptions, it's like you either have to evade reality and accept these basic (laughs) assumptions so that you can interact with the group and do things the way that they do it. Or you have to stand against it. And um, he says stand against it in the sense like being very sure because he believes in absolute truth. But for me, it would be standing against the group unsure, unsure and possibly become a scapegoat. And and then uh, Rene Girard kicks in. No, I'm <laughs> I mean, it definitely. I mean, I've, I've already tagged one French philosopher onto him. I mean, yeah, we might as well hurt. just start really tagging a bunch of them. No, um, so yeah, not not yeah. a not a thing against Sartre, but you know, once you've read one French philosopher, you've read them all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then fighting words. I'm not touching yes. that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, man. Uh, but you haven't read French sociologists. No, I'm kidding. Um, so um, I think this has been really helpful. It took us a while to get to where this was practical. Right. But but I think I think also the one of the things I love about Bayon was I was reading him in prep for this because I had, you know, other than seeing him reference in that end notes essay. I, you know, I, I'm always like, oh, another psychoanalysis. Who cares? Like, mm-hmm, um, yeah, I P, it's for for. His, I, I think it's funny that like modern monetary theorists and psychoanalysts are probably the two most common guests I have on the show. And it's probably just because I pick fights with them all the time. <laughs> but um, uh, w- what I would say about that is in all seriousness, um, I didn't take my very seriously because I didn't know the British psychoanalytic tradition and, I, I do think there are insights to be learned from Freud and even Lacan, who I, who, you know, and definitely from, from other psychoanalysts, uh, Klein, I, I, I tend to think is important. Um, I'm, you know, uh, I think a lot of it is, is interesting, but I also have found that I, I tend to think that it's stuck in like early 20th century linguistics, like this paradigm for science. Um, and thus, uh a lot of stuff it really is better to move into like um just cognitive behavior therapy and and stuff that i think is also kind of lame but like yeah. you know um right right absolutely and uh i guess i guess this is what you were asking before but i guess it's probably better that we ended this way so um with Bion, mm. the the benefits of having him and say a socialist analysis is that first off, um, he considers um, thinking. And he doesn't consider thinking as an isolated, um, atomized thing where it's all in your head. He accepts that there's a social cause to those thoughts and to the way you think about them, which I think is important because I think sometimes even with people who are on the left, you talk to them 
And when you start getting to things like propaganda, I, I'll give a, a personal gripe here uh, because I detest um, Caitlin here. I'm happy about this. So, um, but she will talk about propaganda and she talks about it as if it's covering up the truth. And what the truth is, is it's actually socialism. You know, mm. the, the world secretly goes by socialist. I don't know what you would call it. She's not that developed of a thinker, but socialist rules, let's say. Who's not? And, uh, Caitlin Johnstone. Okay, yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 Johnstone fell out uh, just because of a blip, so go ahead. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, so, sometime, Sometimes if I need to be irritated, I will read her. But um, basically... Um, you know, she'll she'll set up something like that where the, the truth is actually whatever it is she believes, but the propaganda covers our you know our right. eyes and let it which is and, both what conspiracy theorists and Christians do, frankly. I mean, like right, Christians exactly. have the God things like me problems, conspiracy theorists have the conspirators are all out to get yeah, me. The big lie. And I also I also know what they think because I don't know how. Right. And, and uh, right. you know, but it's it, the, the, the absolute the individual manifestations are different, but the basic right. impulse is like I can create a world where there's only one thin veneer between the outside world and me being right, good right. and moral. Right. Know? Right. And, and that's Very that's what Right. And, and, and that's why her solution to all this, which she wrote about early on, which she was like, oh, be your own revolution. It's like, what the fuck? That means nothing. That has no meaning whatsoever. But um. This is where Bion is useful because in that view of things, for example, the thoughts are itemized. You, you just come up with your own thoughts and you project them onto a world that apparently, you know, you can't understand. But for Bion, Bion would argue, um, and I think this would be good for a socialist approach, is that thoughts are social. Thoughts come from society. And the way we think about things is not only influenced by other individuals but it's influenced by society itself and the way society allows for those relations mm -hmm. which i would think would get into marx with uh material conditions <laughs> and social relations and um that's the first benefit is that it allows for thinking to uh, i would argue kind of enter in to understanding any particular program, any particular approach, because it forces you to say, okay, these are the, you know, even if you come up with solutions, it causes you to go, okay, why do we think that these will work? And then ultimately, at least what I find is the reason people think certain, uh, uh, certain solutions will work is because our society is, develops us in such a way that we consider that to be the only type of relation or, you know, the only form of relation. Um, uh, let's see, a good example of this is like activism, like, like going in, 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 in uh, you know, protesting something. This is something we've done for a while. We've done this protests have been around forever. And no, I think their meaning has significantly changed since the 60s. It, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so I think that kind of coincides with the fact that society has significantly changed. Mm. And so, but we keep doing protests and they keep not, you know, yielding anything. And so, you know, kind of a Bionian approach would be like, okay, why do we think that these will work? Well, but it, uh, people will tell me that it builds morale among socialists. That's the normal, like, route, you know. Uh, yes. 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 I, I, that's a, uh, I, I, I have a problem with the public and the populace. I'm quite the elitist. So we know, you, you know, yeah. <laughs> but um, so my bias is to say no to that and reject that. It doesn't, I don't think it builds solidarity. I think what it does is it builds cheap solidarity, cheap morale. It lasts just as long as the conflict lasts. And once the conflict is over, whether it's because people move on, and they don't care, or it's because the problem gets solved, then that morale and solidarity goes away. And so, you know, it's 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 cheap populism, more or less. And so mm -hmm. um, that's that's the first use to buy on that's very important. The second use to buy on is the the group mentality and the group culture thing. I think it's a good way to approach cultural ideas, cultural analysis 
where you can understand that the basis of that cultural, you know, phenomenon is is based upon uh, dissent. It's based upon uh, problems with relating to the group as a whole. Mm -hmm. So the the left uh, fragmenting is more or less just a relationship to the fact that people are having a hard, you know, are, are unable to relate to whatever we think the left is. Right. It just makes people feel better. All sides of politics are fragmenting at any given time. Yes, right. Like, right, yes. it's just the, the left doesn't have the for for reasons of orientation that I ex I explained an episode that has not come out yet, unless you're a Patreon uh, with Anton Yeager over in the EU. Um, the 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 structural mission of the left means that inertia hurts it more. Um, and whereas inertia and fragmentation amongst a uh, status quo um organization an organization that whatever however radical it posits wants to protect some of the static quo which would be also liberals but definitely conservatives yes um uh it's easier to maintain because all you have to do is survive and you've actually won whereas mm -hmm. whereas like a leftist orientation in in progressing its agenda actually does have to deliver on things um, that are substantially different from the status quo by its orientational naming. And yes. so it's always got a harder task at hand. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's not totally true for reactionaries, actually, because reactionaries and conservatives should not be read as the same thing. And reactionaries have a a less status quo. They're also negational of the status quo, but in the opposite direction. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's... Um, it, it, there, there, there isn't a one-to-one -one corollary, but it's something I think we have to look at. It why, like, we're are we have social fragmentation um, and political fragmentation, but then within these movements, there are political fragmentation. But fragmentation is going to be more disadvantageous to one group than the other because of the nature of the group. Mm. And so, fragmentation it hurts the right, but it doesn't hurt the right as bad. Um, right. And, and unfortunately, liberals and leftists for years have always taken this to mean that that rightist were more unified. And as a former rightist, I can tell you that is not remotely true. They're actually less unified. Uh, but, yeah. I, but, I was going to say, I, sorry, go ahead. Um, I was going to say, I, I grew up as a Christian conservative. So I, I understand that. Yeah, like I, you have like weird debates over like who's an Armenian and who's a Calvinist. Like, yes. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and uh, I don't miss those debates. And I, I, are you, I was are you say, a post trib or pre trib trip? Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> which version of the creed do you use? Oh my god! Uh, <laughs> oh god! Uh, just talk, I was gonna, talk I, about fragmentation. I just, just uh, well, I was gonna, I was out. gonna say, I'm, I'm one of those people. I, I, I always call, uh, tell people that I'm a heathen atheist because I, I, I have problems with Christians and people who believe in religion, but I also have problems with like New Age spiritualists and stuff. I want to hit them both, but. Um, nevertheless, um, I, I, uh, God, now uh, I see I threw you off. Uh, yeah, you, you did throw me off. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say. So, um, yeah, I, I find that the fragmentation, the reason I think conservatives handle it better as well is they kind of have embedded that notion into, um, their narrative uh, to speak broadly right because you know th they want to protect the status quo and if they can say hey look the status quo is coming apart you know then and it's always fragile and then that's part of their whole appeal right is like right. we're protecting a fragile status quo that is necessarily fragmented it has polycentric institutions in it that you have to protect mm -hmm. all the institutions separately right and in so much that there if you take the burkean view which most conservatives in America don't. They think they do, but they actually yeah, don't. But right, if you yeah. do, then you're like, oh, but some of these social institutions can progress, but like slowly over time and, mm -hmm. and, and, and not in the in I, I, I wrote, I wrote for a Berkey and yeah, yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we all have our, yes. our, uh, our, our sketchy past, I suppose. Right. But like, well, at least I wasn't a Democrat. <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say, uh, uh, I, I wrote for him, but I was writing, writing in negation. He had uh, some idea that government needed virtue, and I was like, no, it does not. Yeah, that's but, that's, that's weirdly like Rose Pierian, funnily enough. Yeah, it, it that that's kind of like what I saw with uh, some things I've seen with Charlie Kirk when I, I'm forced to have to view that. Um, uh, yeah, my, my I will just go ahead and tell my bias is why the hell would anyone ever subject themselves to that except to occasionally know what what 
the dumb polemics on the other side are. Yeah, but they're it, specifically the yeah. dumb polemics. Right. I was I was gonna say it, it must be the it must be the the Sartrean in, in me, you know, and sadomasochism just um <laughs> no, but um yeah, I um that's really unfortunate. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. Um but you can um, hire dominatrices for cheaper to your psyche. Probably yeah, probably. Um I, yeah, I was gonna. Uh, fuck. Well, what was I gonna say? Eh, shit. Yeah, I, I I give it up. Anyway, um, I I was gonna add this. So okay, add one that. thing, um, I mean, I know we're close to, uh, we're close to. Oh, uh, we're five minutes away. Yeah. Two so hours. we're gonna wrap it up soon. But yeah. Okay. Um. Well, I've I've said that. I guess I've said the two things about Bion. Um, that I think are good for the the socialist program. Or a socialist program, I should say, leftist. Um, the future socialist program that we hope yes, will lead us all right. to the glorious revolution. Oh yeah, you know, um, we'll we'll be completely dependent on it. Um, I I I was gonna say I um, the the one reason that I I unite Bion with Sartre, besides the fact that I found Sartre first, is in Sartre's uh, CDR. Um, I always found it interesting that his view of how the world changes is not sort of this autonomous historical change that's always happening, you know, kind of Nietzsche's reality is always in flux, always changing. Um, he seemed to think, as far as I can understand it, that uh, change was about uh, moving existing things around. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think you know, I, I unite him with Bion is because Bion kind of gives an explanation to that group movement or attempt to group uh, a group movement, which then can relate to propaganda and right. other things. Yeah, I, I find this interesting because what I my natural tendency is to graft this on to both, you know, my version of historical materialism via Marxism, but also systems theory, uh, war, war dynamics. Um, uh, econ you know, uh, psychological interactions with economic theory, which I actually think is under under understood. You know, even in Marxism, that we don't really right. we don't really understand um, the psychology of of money and power relations yes, and, and how right. they're hidden and manifested, and 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 a change. In, and also, like, there's lots of maladaptive behaviors that are common on the left because they don't have they've never come from functional work groups like they haven't been parts of functional jobs a lot of the time mostly mm -hmm. been in student centers uh tied to infrastructural you know infrastructural government is somewhat isolated from its competence being a thing that it has to be answered <laughs> to and i know that sounds like a conservative argument but um it, it's it's an observation right um you, you know and I think this is a problem and it's a problem for marginal politics in general, actually it doesn't matter the content here, the people who are hurting and are also most fragmented are the people who are going to be attracted to a, to a politics that promises the most change. Yes. That's, that's yeah. inevitable. Like, and that's, that means that like any group of, um, of people who are offering radical change, uh, is going to start off with a bunch of malcontents and weirdos from from the class and and that are highly alienated even from their own class position mm -hmm. or whatever social position we're talking about. Right. And as they grow, it will change. And yes. and the and the function of the work group will change too, and to put it in Bionian terms. But what also it, it the danger there is one, well, those people who come in initially have maladaptive habits that you don't really want to adopt. But two when you start to tamp, tamp down on that and become more and more mass, you incorporate more and more of the prior culture into your culture, and thus that can yes. stop your radical impetus in the first place. Right. Time. Absolutely. And yeah. And that's it, a it's, tension that yeah. it's hard to navigate. Right. It, yeah, absolutely. And I um yeah, it it, it definitely yeah, definitely people who are in fragmented groups will will, you know, follow their valency type and they'll mm -hmm. kind of adhere to things that indulge their basic assumptions. So, yeah. um, unless yeah, you're it, totally traumatized and don't have basic assumptions anymore, but that's just because you're probably not functional, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we we should always try to look at the way we think about things and the way that's influenced in society. All right. Well, thank you for that, uh, Charlie. And I think yeah. this gives the people a lot of stuff to talk about. A little bit different from 
my yeah. four days of MMT talk. <laughs> Um, and for those who are listening to the future, uh, you need to go into Patreon and my and my various discussions on this is revolution to know why that that's come up. I'm going to go take a nap because I'm not yeah. feeling well. Um, thank you again. Um, we'll have you on probably over the end of the summer and uh, well, maybe in the summer, maybe that six months away. We'll do it two or three months um, uh, to announce for my for my droogs here. Um, uh, people coming up. Karen Spring has finally been rescheduled. It's not going to be this Friday. It's going to be next Friday. Also on that day, I'm going to have an interview with Stephen Ham. Um, so uh, Steve, uh, Stephen Hamill, not Stephen Ham. That Stephen Hamill of uh, the Measures Taken fame. Have Parker McQueenie um, from the DSA uh, and for uh, coming on. I have Max Seho on Monday on a special appearance. Coming on for Superstructure podcast, I debated him in the past. If you don't listen to Superstructure, he's one of the critical theorists in MTs. And we're not coming. I don't think he's coming on to talk MMT. I think we're just coming on to talk politics and and his uh, his engagements with 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 some of mine. Uh, I, I'm gonna take the next week. I'm gonna rest, and then on Friday, Mir Ball will be coming on to talk about the Freitas model. Then I have Dr. Haroon coming on to talk about uh, Stalinism, the creation of nations and national identity and how this backfired. Uh, then on the 25th, another day where I have two guests. I have um, uh, Roxy from the UK who wrote an article for Cosmonaut on gender uh, abolition and trans identity um, uh, coming on to talk to me about that. And... Uh, Greg Belvedere is coming on uh, in the evening to talk about, um, oh, crap, um, co-ops. And then in March, uh, at, and we got, I still have invites out for, for a bunch of people, but what's been confirmed, uh, DB of What is Politics is coming on to critique David Graver's book, The Theory of Everything. Sam Kangaroo is coming on to defend the honor of Mosler MMT and the honor of David Graver. Um, but we're not going to debate because I don't do that shit. Um, we're just going to have a nice conversation. Um, uh, sometime in the next month, one dime from, uh, from the channel, one dime will be coming on on a Friday as well. Uh, probably in the early March, uh, Mike Kim will be coming on to talk about veterans, trauma, North Korea, and whatever else is on his mind. Jared Levy of uh, cyber dandy fame or Jared of cyber dandy fame. Oh, probably shouldn't say his name. Um, will be uh, coming on to talk about anti-communism. And I've invited uh, people. Oh, and uh, Dwayne Monroe will be talking to come on about critical technology in the cloud. And I will be starting a series of guests on critical technology. I have asked uh, Dr. Catherine Sales to come on, but I have not confirmed that. So don't think that as a given guest yet. And uh uh, there's about 10 other people in the pipeline. I, I, I am booking out pretty far ahead. Um, also people will be returning. Um, so, uh, RC will come back. Maybe some other people have come on in the past in the early days. Who knows? I might ask Ben Dredges back on to talk to me about, <laughs> it's about, uh, Christopher Higgins and then uh, have him get in a fist fight with, yeah. our, with Charlie. Oh, um, that would, that would be, that would be fun. It, I was going to say, you, you have people coming back on. It's, it's the dialectical circuality. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, <laughs> we make each other. Um, and uh, who knows? But there's lots of stuff coming up. And I just wanted to tell you guys what's coming up. I know I said I was going to be doing less. Um, I am actually doing less. What people don't know is I am not doing other podcasts uh, nearly as much and producing as much. Um, in fact, I'm relying more on my producer, Paul. Uh, um, but... I also have COVID, so I can't do a whole lot right now. And and once I run out of my other work, if I can talk, this is something I can do for my chair until I pass out, which I'm about <laughs> to do. All right. And with that, uh, I'm going to let you out with the chill clothes um, so that you guys can chill out.